The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Kuyong. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's my pleasure to rise in this House to follow what was a very passionate and thoughtful contribution by the member for Canning, as well as my colleague, the member for Cook. Um, this bill, which will see foreign workers on overseas resource installations fall within the migration zone of Australia, thereby requiring a visa. That's what this is all about. It follows on from a federal court decision in May last year um, called the All Seas Construction Case, which found that two pipe-laying vessels and the workers on it did not fall within the migration zone. But, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, we can't support this bill. We can't support this bill because, one, we know what its motivations are about. And the member for Canning explained to this House that this is all about improving the union's ability to recruit workers. This is all about payback. Secondly, there hasn't been a rigorous analysis of the economic impacts of this bill because it's going to increase the burden on one of our most productive sectors in the economy, namely our resources industry. And three, we don't know what the impact is going to be on our border protection system. Because what happens if somebody goes onto these uh, uh, offshore resource rigs and starts to seek um, uh, asylum that way, do they fall within the migration zone of Australia as a result of this bill? That's a legitimate question. And given this government's absolute failure to protect our borders, where we've seen more than 43,000 unauthorised arrivals come in just the few years that Labor has been in government, we cannot take them at their word. We cannot trust this government to protect our borders, let alone to protect the resource industry which does so much for the economic growth of this country. So, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, what we are proposing today is that this bill goes to a Senate Legal and Constitutional Committee where the proper questions are asked, the analysis is undertaken and ultimately the best interests of the Australian people and the Australian economy will subsequently be served after we have had a full debate about the merits of this bill. Now, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, you don't have to take my word for this. You have to hear from companies and industry bodies that are engaged in this sector to hear what they think about this government bill before us today. The Australian Metals and Mines Association has said that this bill will, quote, impose a further level of suffocating regulatory burden on the offshore resource sector for no appreciable social or other gain and at a likely high economic cost. The member for Goldstein, the shadow minister for finance who's sitting in this chamber, he knows all about what it takes to get the productivity of our country moving. And when he hears the words of the Australian Metals and Mines Association talk about this bill in the most derogatory terms, he knows, as well as I do, that this is bad news for the Australian economy, an economy which, after September 14, he will hopefully have his hands at the reins. This body has also said that this bill would, quote, put at risk the viability of current projects and weigh heavily against the commencement of future projects. Now, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, why is that important? That's important because currently there is a pipeline of projects in Australia which is above $100 billion just for the resource sector alone. But we have seen, under this government and due to the policies of this government, significant resource projects, both onshore and offshore, either postponed or cancelled, because Australia is in danger of becoming a low-productivity, high-cost economy. 
And all, we all know about Olympic Dam, that $30 billion project in South Australia and the Port Hedland extension. And we know a number of our major energy companies. I saw the Okaji project is now being put on hold by Mitsubishi. All these projects which would deliver untold economic benefits and employment benefits to our country have now been put on hold because of the costs of doing business in Australia. And there you have the Australian Metals and Mines Association making it abundantly clear that the legislation before this House is putting that or those projects in jeopardy. Now we are the ninth largest energy and oil producer in the world. This is a multi-billion dollar industry in Australia which contributes up to 2.5 per cent of GDP on an annual basis and it's growing because in our region there are more than 3 billion people who will be entering the middle class between now and 2050. You know, China, 1.3 billion people. India, another 1.3 billion people. Those people in those countries, together with Vietnam and Indonesia, are moving rapidly up the class into the middle class, rapidly up the system into the middle classes. And as a consequence of that, they are demanding energy. They're demanding energy to build their economies, to put in new, new infrastructure in place and to provide for the homes and the services that we have all come to take for granted here in Australia or in other advanced economies around the world. So Australia is in a perfect position to service those countries as a net energy exporter, to support those middle classes as they go up the value chain and enter the middle classes. Now, we can do that only if we are in a cost-effective place in which to do business and which to produce energy. Now, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, I said at the start we couldn't support this bill because we know that it is an explicit, unashamed gra grab for power by the union movement by the masters of the Labor Party in the Maritime Union and in the CFMEU. If it's not good enough to provide millions of dollars to the Labor Party, it is good enough for them to get 50 per cent, the unions, 50 per cent of all Labor votes at federal and state caucuses, and to get 100 per cent of the Labor caucus being a member of the union. Now, why is this an issue? This is an issue, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, because in the Australian economy today, in the private sector, only 13 per cent of the workforce belong to the unions. And when you take into account the public sector, it rises to 20 per cent. But the unions are dominating the legislative agenda of this government. And this is setting back the economic priorities for the Australian country. And we had the former head of the HSU, Cathy Jackson, say of the member for Maribyrnong, who is the Minister for Workplace Relations in this country, and the former secretary of the AWU, say that he is Dracula in charge of the blood bank. And boy, is he that. And what we've seen, and my mem the member for Canning referred in his speech to the fair work legislation that this parliament de debated just a couple of weeks ago, and the right of entry provisions, which will ensure that no worker around this country will be able to eat their lunch in peace and quiet anymore. Because what this House passed was right of entry provisions, which will see unions enter into the lunch hours of workers right around the country to try to recruit them to their unions. And what is more, when these union reps have to travel a far distance, they'll be sending a bill to the employer to pay for their travel expenses. How crazy a system has this become? There are more than 120 provisions in the Fair Work Act which you have passed that have increased the power of the unions at the expense of the employee and at the expense of the employer. 
And it's no wonder that industrial disputes have more than doubled under this government. It's no wonder that this government has abolished the Australian Building and Construction Commission and all that that did to create billions of dollars in new wealth and productivity improvements in our economy. It is no wonder that you have launched a war on the 457 system and it's all because you are paying back your union mates. Now, the 457s is very relevant to this debate because the 457s is about foreign workers. Just as this debate is about foreign workers on overseas resource installations. Now, on 457s, you have said you have said that you don't want people on 457s coming to this country. That is effectively what you have said. And this is despite the Minister for Immigration, Chris Bowen, saying at the time in January that you as a government have got the balance right on 457s. And the Prime Minister of this country, Julia Gillard, saying in China when she was visiting there just recently that the balance is right on 457s. And this is despite the number of people on 457s in this country dramatically increasing to a record high number of 125,000 today. And this is despite half the members of the Transport Workers Union, including Tony Sheldon's own personal staff, being members who are here on 457s. And this is despite the Prime Minister's Scottish Svengali, John McTiernan, also being here on a 457. Despite all of that evidence, Despite the fact that people coming to this country on 457s are filling voids in our labour force, in information technology, in engineering, in health services, in the resources sector, you have put all that aside to confect an argument against 457s based on what you are being told by your union paymasters. Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, this is not good for this country that we have seen a government become totally beholden to the power of the union movement. And this bill before this House is just the latest example of it. This bill before the House is the latest instalment of an attack on foreign workers and an attack on the most productive sectors of our economy. It's very funny that on the 457s, the Prime Minister said, quote, we inherited the previous from the previous government a 457 temporary foreign worker visa program that was totally out of control. If it's so out of control, why did you see the numbers of foreign workers coming to this country increase dramatically to the record high number of 125,000 that it is today? You did it because you did it because you understood back then, that 457s were an important part of the economy. And even Chris Bowen said, migration is shaped by Australia's economic needs and the temporary business 457 visa is a key pillar in this approach. And the Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, said, we will need skilled migration. I believe we've got the visa settings right, particularly with short-term 457 visas. So we know we know that you started a war on 457s for the very same reason you are starting a war against those foreign workers who are working on offshore resource activities, who are doing so to improve the economic management of those resource companies that produce export dollars for the Australian economy and help grow our system. And that is the key issue here. So, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, in conclusion, I want to say that we cannot support the bill before this House. We cannot support the bill before this House because there hasn't been the rigorous consultation with the industry. There hasn't been an assessment of the economic impact this higher regulatory burden will have. And because of the complicating factors it may have for our border protection policies and our ability to protect our borders. 
And most of all, we cannot support this because this is just a payback to the union movement by the Labor Party. Thank you.